Hello, we are going to review a portion of the First Amendment centered on freedom of speech and freedom of the press. One thing you can see at the top, the first and fourteenth, give to all people the right to have their say and the right to hear what others have to say. The largest ruling in this area is that when you infringe on others' rights and when you incite people to action, which is illegal, you can be limited. So on this area, it says the guarantees of free speech and press are intended to protect the expression of unpopular views. Justifer Oliver Wendell Holmes stated these guarantees uh, seek to ensure freedom for the thought that we hate. So even though a lot of these ideas are very unpopular in a democracy, it's important for the rights of the minority to be heard and not to be stifled. I'd like to go over a couple things that deal with speech. Some forms of expression are not protected by the Constitution, which means you can't do whatever you want. Libel is false and malicious use of printed word. So libel is print, slander is spoken. One case, the New York Times versus Sullivan. This says the case set the guidelines for determining whether public officials and public figures could win damage suits. To do so, individuals must prove that the defamatory statements were made with actual malice and disregard for the truth. This New York Times versus Sullivan case really set the standard for any politician or public figure that if things are said against them, you have to prove in a court of law that the person intended harm or malicious intent, and that can really raise the bar. It's a very hard thing to do. So libel, just because somebody says something, it doesn't mean you are protected always. You can be held accountable if the person can prove actual malice and reckless disregard. Slander is the same way. Your words are your own, and you can say whatever you want, but they are relative to somebody else. You can be held accountable for slander, and if someone sues for slander, then those are false and malicious use of words used to harm another person, and that can um, be upheld in a court of law that you cannot say those things. Obscenity and obscene images these are not protected just because somebody wants to print something or submit something on the internet doesn't mean it's always protected. There's a famous court case actually too, Roth versus the United States. The Roth was the first time the court tried to even define what obscene was. Their largest argument, what is obscene to one person, isn't always obscene to the next person. So they had a very hard time with different regions of the United States uh, having different standards, trying to come up with one definition. The largest thing um, that they came up with, it said it prevented every obscene, lewd, lascivious, or filthy piece of material from mailing, that you can't just mail things to people's houses unsolicited. The next case to clarify obscenity, Miller versus California, this is a court case where the court really returned the definition of obscenity back to local communities. And what they said was, in order for something to be obscene, the local community has to determine, does that image, does that piece of art, does that movie lack serious, literary, artistic, political, or scientific value? That's nicknamed the slap test. Um, serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. So Miller versus California has been the filter through which obscenity has been um, used by local communities to either get rid of something or to defend something. I'd like to talk about symbolic speech for a moment as well, looking at the next slide. Symbolic is when an action occurs, but you're still conveying a message, so communicating ideas by conduct. Picketing is a form of expression which involves patrolling a business site by workers. If it is peaceful and doesn't interfere with business, it is allowed. That's a peaceful sign of protest. Draft card burning in the United States versus O'Brien. This is one of those images where you have a government document and somebody burnt a government document. The uh, court, in this case, upheld the conviction and stated these uh, principles. If the object of the protest is within the powers of the government, so drafting men, 
they said you would have to go, so they upheld that. Number two, whatever restriction is placed on expression is not greater than necessary in the circumstances. And number three, the government's real interest in the matter is not to squelch dissent. So you can't have the main purpose just to have not have people meet. There has to be some underlying reason. The only thing, and I might say this later, the only way that the government can ever regulate gathering is by time, place, and manner. That is a very, very huge principle. Time, place, and manner can be regulated. So if somebody wants to hold a march and noise field during the middle of the day, the city may not say that you can have it at noon because it could interfere with school. So in a sense, they're regulating the time of day, the place, noise field might be not be a good venue because it could interrupt traffic in homes around the area, and the manner, they can always have police present to keep the peace, so the city can place or state or federal government can place those guidelines. Cross burning in Virginia versus um, black has been a a very controversial form of hate speech, and they are trying to define this, that if somebody is conveying a message like burning a cross in somebody's yard, is that under the guard of symbolic speech? And what this said, it said upheld a state law that prohibits cross burning because they say it is an act of intimidation and uh, it does go against protected speech. So if you hear protected, it means the court wants it, but unprotected speech means you cannot do that. It's a sign of bullying. It's an expression that is considered hate, and that is not protected by the law. Now, students in schools, one thing that you will see about schools is that when a student protests, if it does not interfere with the normal school day, the court most likely will uphold it. A very famous case, Tinker versus Des Moines. The court protected symbolic speech of students. All they did was wear a black armband to protest the Vietnam War. Uh, a famous quote, it says, students do not leave their rights at the schoolhouse gate. But you will see that in order to protect civility and order within a school, sometimes students' rights are not upheld. The case that we talked about, Morse versus Frederick, uh, the oral argument that we listened to, the Bong Hits for Jesus case, sided with the school because they said there has to be a degree of citizenship if they want to say no promotion to drugs and alcohol because it's against school policy, then the school has every right to do that. Symbolic speech can also be found in money. They said uh, in a famous court case, Buckley versus Vallejo, and you might need to revisit this in the campaign unit, the court said that money is symbolic. Wow, I misspelled it again. <laughs> Another word. Symbolic expression of support. Therefore, money does equal speech, and that is a protected form of speech if you spend money on yourself. But if you spend money on behalf of others or you donate, then that can be regulated. And that's where we got into the hard money versus soft money. Flag burning, another very uh, popular case. It was called Texas versus Johnson. And Johnson was very much against Ronald Reagan's policies. So he protested outside the Republican convention in 1984. There happened to be a Texas law that said you cannot burn um, the American flag. It's a Texas state law that says no, so they arrested Johnson, and he protested, saying it's my right to be able to burn the American flag, and the Supreme Court upheld that right as symbolic speech, that they wanted to express discontent with the United States government, so they went ahead and upheld that. So all of these are different ways uh, to look at symbolic speech. You have to look at is speech protected, and under what situations will speech be protected? Seditious speech, remember we talked about in wartime, things can be very different. And I'm going to wrap this up with our last slide here. Sedition is the crime of trying to overthrow the government by force or to disrupt its laws. And sed seditious speech is urging contact, uh, conduct, and it is not protected by the First Amendment. You can read the Alien and Sedition and Sedition Act of 1917. You probably studied in history. But I want you to really highlight this case called Schenck versus the United States. This is a case that established what we now know as the clear and present danger rule. And it really does have a major impact. 
the constitutionality of the Espionage Act was upheld. Remember, in times of war, um, things can be a little bit trickier. But what this person, Shank, was doing, he um, was trying to obstruct the war effort by sending out leaflets uh, that urged men to not go with the draft, to resist the call. And the court said, you can believe what you want, but you cannot act on those beliefs. You, anytime you incite people to act against the government, you can be held responsible. So the Supreme Court upheld Shank's conviction and established what we know as the clear and present danger rule. Anytime you see this phrase, words can be weapons. And when words are used as weapons, the court does not always protect the constitutionality of it. So I will let you um, look at that portion. The last ones here, prior restraint, the government censorship of the press. Uh, sometimes what it says here, prior restraint is, can you stop something from being printed before it's ever printed? So I write a story. Can the government step in and say, you don't have the right to print that? Press is not protected by the First Amendment um, for insurrection, forcible resistance, etc. The court later expanded the expression but deferred to the Supreme Court in times of crisis. So the ruling is you can't tell someone not to print something, but in several cases the government has one, uh, especially in wartime, things can be prevented. The major ruling here is normally you have to prove that it's national security or the nation could be at risk. Dennis versus the United States upheld the Smith Act, which was the court upheld the convictions of communist preaching revolution. Yates later modified it. The court held that merely to urge someone to believe something, in contrast to urging them to do something, is an illegal. Believing is one thing, acting on that is another. The other case is the Skokie case, the court ruled the speech calling for illegal acts is protected if the action is not imminent. So speaking one thing again is permissible, but not acting on it. Hate crimes are never, ever tolerated. So I want to make sure it is clear that saying one thing is one thing, but when you encourage people to act on those beliefs, that's when the government has said that you cannot do that. These last ones right here, the Brandenburg versus Ohio and the Skokie case help demonstrate the meaning of the First Amendment and the American commitment to freedom of speech. Remember, the court is protecting the voice of the minority uh, opinion. It doesn't mean that the court agrees with the opinion. It just means they're upholding their right, even incredibly unpopular opinions, uh, to be believed by people because they want to protect the rights of the minority. But it doesn't mean that you can act on those things. You can go ahead and read this. Um, I've spelled it out, and I don't need to go over these, but I think you'll see that these are examples um, which go along with Brandenburg versus Ohio, if it's likely to incite action. And then the Skokie case, hate speech is at times permissible, but never, never hate crimes. This last portion, and this is pretty self-explanatory, prior restraint, I just said it, near versus Minnesota, dealt with the press, it struck down a state law that prohibited the publication of any malicious, scandalous, and defamatory periodicals. The Minnesota paper had printed several articles charging public officials with corruption. The Supreme Court held that free press does not allow prior restraint on publication except in extreme situations. The New York Times, the Pentagon Papers pace case, we've talked about that a little bit. Um, the Supreme Court did allow papers to be published because the government could not prove that that was a national security risk. So again, it has to be pretty compelling for the government to step in and stop publication of an item. Hazelwood School District versus Kuhlmeyer is an example of speech, I mean of press, 
in the school building. And in this case, it said school officials have very broad powers to censor school newspapers or publications. Sometimes a student wants to write something, the school principal still has the right to say no because they are upholding a, a school law or statute and they want to make sure that that is clear. So sometimes the school can step in. All right, the media, and you can read those about shield laws, protecting the media. I think those are pretty self-explanatory by reading those things. It just says that um, reporters are protected. And petition, I already talked about that. Time, place, and manner can be regulated. Please review those cases just so you have an overview of the last portions of the First Amendment.